In this video, we will learn about the history of Jammu and Kashmir, its religious distribution, what was the role of British, the political uprising in the state, and how it acquired its modern shape and despite all effort, it did not develop into a fully coherent identity. We'll also learn how Article 370 and 35A came into existence. Many of you must be aware that Article 370 gave special status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir giving the Indian Parliament authority only over external affairs, defence, communication and the currency. So there's a lot of things we'll learn and cover in this video. So sit tight and let's begin. At the time of independence in 1947, the whole of the Indian subcontinent was divided into two sets of territories. One was under direct British rule and the other was under the princely rule and those were referred to as princely states. Before 1947, there were 565 princely states in the entire Indian subcontinent. We know the story, right? The East India Company arrived at the port of Surat in 1608 during the rule of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. That's how trade began. The company rule in India effectively began in 1757 to 1857, after which the British Crown took direct control of the Indian subcontinent in the form of New British Raj and it continued till 15th August 1947. So if you see, the British ruled India for about 200 years. And it was on 15th August 1947, India got independence. Basically, we can also say that the British government announced their intention of transferring the power of British India to Indian hands. That meant, the power from one government has to go into the hands of another. And at that time, there was only one widespread political party, the Indian National Congress that had the opportunity to form the first government of India. So moments back I told you that at the time of independence the whole of Indian subcontinent was divided into two sets of territories, British ruled provinces and princely states. Naturally once the transfer of power happened, the territories which were under the direct British rule, only those were transferred in the hands of the Indian government. Have a look at this map. The blue coloured regions were princely states. They were all scattered. There was no uniformity. As you can imagine, it would have been so hard to construct or structure a national identity with this kind of challenge. And the challenge was to join all scattered princely states into the Union of India. So this became the main objective of the Indian government. It is also called as the political integration of the princely states. After independence, the government of India pursued this goal over the next decade. Another important point is, in 1947, when the British finally decided their plans for quitting India, before leaving, they successfully executed the plan of the partition of British Indian territories into the two independent dominions of India and Pakistan, which is also famously known as the Mountbatten Plan. Keep in mind, only the British ruled provinces were partitioned. Since the princely states were not part of the British province, they could not be partitioned by the British. That means, after 15th August 1947, the princely states would be completely independent and they would not receive any form of help or support from the government of India for defence, finance and other infrastructure. Now, these independent princely states had two options, either to join India or to join Pakistan. A lot of people have created this confusion that there was a third option too, which is to remain independent. But if you go through the Memorandum of British Cabinet Mission document, that was presented to the Chancellor of Chamber of Princes in India on May 12, 1946 by Lord Pethick Lawrence, it does not mention anything regarding independency of the rulers of the princely states. The document makes it amply clear that all the rulers of the princely states, including Jammu and Kashmir, have two options, that is, either to accede to India or to Pakistan, and that option has to be exercised solely by the rulers because the British had some administrative arrangements with the rulers of the princely states, in which the British entered into different treaties with the rulers. So you see, in many ways, the princely states were dependent on the British government during its paramountcy period. So at the time of independence, the paramountcy of the British lapsed and the rulers were left with only two options, either to accede to India or to Pakistan. By remaining independent, they would have barely been able to support their administration. So there was no third option to remain independent, and I'll tell you more about it later. If you see the map, you will realize that the princely states covered around 45% of the total geographical area of unified India. That's how Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who was the first Deputy Prime Minister of India, and was also a politician with the Indian National Congress, 
and VP Menon, who was an Indian senior civil servant of that time. They both, under Lord Mountbatten, were in charge of relations with the princely states. And their objective was to convince the rulers by diplomacy and good relations so that they merge with India. Basically, they acted like a salesman on behalf of India to persuade and convince these princely states to join the Indian Dominion. Now, if you were to give your house for rent, you would make something called a rent agreement, right? Which is a legal document that contains certain rules and guidelines which you want your tenants to follow. In the same way, in 1947, a legal document was created by the Government of India Act 1935, which is called the Instrument of Accession. As per this concept, the rulers of the princely states had to sign the Instrument of Accession if they wanted to join the new dominions of India or Pakistan. Now you need to understand this. 1947 was an important year. Things moved quickly and a lot was happening in that year. The British had finalized their plans for quitting India by 15th August 1947. The plan of partition was decided, because of which communal violence was escalating. Riots were happening, mass casualties and a massive wave of migration took place. Millions of people moved to what they hoped would be a safer territory, with Muslims heading towards Pakistan and Hindus and Sikhs in the direction of India. When all of this was happening, Britain was reluctant to use its troops to maintain law and order. So you can imagine the situation was very bad in the year 1947. And bad is just an understatement. It was horrible. As you saw the map, the blue-coloured regions were princely states. They were all scattered. There was no uniformity. It was so difficult to construct or structure a national identity with this kind of challenge. That's how this instrument of accession was rolled out. And Sardar Vallabhai Patel and VP Menon were working relentlessly to convince the rulers of these princely states to accede with India. Many princely states joined willingly by signing the instrument of accession. Bhadnagar was the first princely state to join the dominion of India. That's how many of the princely states either joined India or Pakistan. But this video is about Jammu and Kashmir and we'll learn about its history, how it became part of India and why it is the point of territorial conflict between India and Pakistan. We'll begin with the story. Today, Kashmir region is a Muslim majority region. Initially, it wasn't like that. If you look at the history of Kashmir, we have to go back in time around 300 BCE. Maurya Emperor Ashoka had a strong connection with Kashmir. During the reign of Ashoka, Kashmir became a part of Maurya Empire and Buddhism was introduced in Kashmir. He even founded the city of Srinagar. By the 4th century AD, Kashmir became a learning place for both Buddhism and Hinduism. In fact, Kashmiri Buddhist missionaries helped spread Buddhism to Tibet and China. After 7th century, significant developments took place in Kashmiri Hinduism. In the centuries that followed, Kashmir produced many poets, philosophers and artists who contributed to Sanskrit literature and Hindu religion. It was during the 11th century, Mahmud of Ghazni made two attempts to conquer Kashmir, but he did not succeed. Hence, we can say that Islam started arriving in North India in the 12th century via the Turkic invasions. But it wasn't that extreme. However, it was during the middle of 14th century, a Tibetan Buddhist refugee named Rinchana, who later converted to Islam and established the first Muslim dynasty in Kashmir. Since then, Islam gradually became the dominant religion in Kashmir. Then the Mughal rule started in 1526. Kashmir did not witness any direct Mughal rule till Akbar became the Mughal emperor. He annexed Kashmir to his Afghan province of Kabul Sabha in 1586. Kashmir was ruled for almost four centuries by the Mughals. After that, the Sikh Empire under Maharaja Ranjit Singh annexed Kashmir from the Mughal Empire in early 19th century. After that, the British East India Company confiscated the Kashmir region from the Sikh Empire after the First Anglo-Sikh War in 1846. The British then sold Kashmir to Maharaja Gulab Singh Jamwal who was a Hindu and the founder of Royal Dogra dynasty of Jammu. Gulab Singh's father was in the army of Ranjit Singh. Gulab Singh was appointed as the Raja of Jammu in 1820 by Maharaja Ranjit Singh himself, making him one of his close associate. Gulab Singh soon captured the lands of Ladakh and Baltistan for the Sikhs. And who knew one day from being a Raja of Jammu, he would become the Maharaja of Jammu, Kashmir Valley, Gilgit Baltistan and Ladakh 
basically all the lands that he helped conquer for the Sikh Empire. So from 1846, the Hindu Dogra rule began in the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, all because of the help from British East India Company. If you see for Maharaja Gulab Singh, it is because of the British East India Company that Kashmir was added to his princely state. If we analyze the process of annexation of Indian kingdoms by the East India Company from 1757 to 1857, you will notice that the company rarely launched a direct military attack on an unknown territory. Instead, it used a variety of political, economic and diplomatic methods to extend its influence before annexing an Indian kingdom. Further, the company was not interested in direct administration of the annexed territory. They were only interested in expanding their trade. And they were also one step ahead. Instead of taking the responsibility of direct administration, why not have a puppet Nawab or a ruler who were willing to grant privileges, finance their wars and meet the demands of trade and other expenses. With that kind of mindset, in the first Anglo-Sikh War of 1846, the East India Company confiscated the Kashmir region from the Sikh Empire and sold it to Maharaja Gulab Singh Jamwal, who was the founder of Royal Dogra Dynasty of Jammu for 75 lakh Nanak Shahi rupees, which was the ruling currency of the Sikh Empire at that time. This entire agreement was formalized in the Treaty of Amritsar, which is executed on 16th March 1846. At that time, the Governor General of India was Henry Hartinge. Needless to say, with this kind of gesture, Maharaja Gulab Singh and Dogra community started favoring the British. Their loyalty came in handy to British during the revolt of 1857. Maharaja Gulab Singh died in 1857 and his son, Ranbir Singh, succeeded the throne a year before. As I said, the Dogra community had some liking towards the British. This was evident during the 1857 revolt. They helped English women and children to seek asylum in Kashmir and sent Kashmiri troops to fight on behalf of the British against the mutineers. The British in return rewarded him by helping in extending the Dogra rule in Kashmir, Gilgit, Hunza and Srinagar. And this kind of relationship went on between Maharaja Ranbir Singh and the British. The British rewarded him immensely for his loyalty. Maharaja Ranbir Singh also brought a lot of reforms in the state. The Ranbir Penal Code, which contained civil and criminal laws, were compiled during his time. He also founded separate departments of foreign affairs, home affairs, civil affairs and army. He also promoted trade and the shawl industry flourished during his period. In 1885, Maharaja Ranbir Singh died. He wrote to the British government and requested them to nominate his younger son Amar Singh as his successor. But the British government chose the other son, that is Pratap Singh, as his successor. You can imagine why the British government did that. They wanted a ruler who was more gullible. Within the British Empire, Jammu and Kashmir was a salute state. The ruler of a salute state in the British Empire gets a 21-gun salute which was authorized from the British Crown. So you can imagine the close relation the state had with the British Empire. Maharaja Pratap Singh died in 1925, but he was succeeded by his nephew Hari Singh. Maharaja Hari Singh was the last ruling Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, and he ruled till 1947. So far we saw how Kashmir went in the hands of one ruler to another. When Kashmir was under the Muslim rule, the Hindus were oppressed. Same way when it was under the Sikh and the Hindu rule, the Muslims had a hard time. There has always been disparity in the state with respect to religion and ethnicity. It is not something that happened recently. Ladakh has always been ethnically and culturally Tibetan and its inhabitants practiced Buddhism. To the south, Jammu had a mixed population of Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs. In the heavily populated Central Kashmir Valley, the population was overwhelmingly Sunni Muslim. However, there was also a small but influential Hindu minority, that is the Kashmiri Pandits. To the north, sparsely populated Baltistan had a population ethnically related to Ladakh, which practiced Shia's Islam. To the northwest, also sparsely populated, Gilgit was an area of diverse mostly Shia's group. And to the west, Punch was occupied by Muslims, but of the different ethnicity than the Kashmir Valley. So the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir never developed into a fully coherent identity. However, till 1947, Jammu and Kashmir with the Muslim majority was under the rule of Maharaja Hari Singh, the last ruling Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. 
Now let's look at the political uprising in British India, which later became the National Movement for Independence, because that has a direct impact on the political uprising in Jammu and Kashmir as well. If we analyze the period of British rule in India, you will realize that the period from 1756 to 1858 was the period of conquest, annexation and consolidation of the Indian territories for the benefit of the East India Company. And as we know, after the revolt of 1857, the rule of the East India Company was transferred to the British Crown. But then in 1857, when the Great Mutiny broke out, which is also referred to as the First Revolt of Independence, where Indians, irrespective of any religion or community, jointly fought against the British. It was then that the British government realized that if the Indian society shared a common feeling, then soon it is going to be the end of their rule. So keeping this in mind, the period from 1858 to 1905 was the time when the British government started injecting communal poison by playing Indians against one another. Princes against people, Hindu against Muslims, caste against castes, and provinces against provinces. The purpose was to keep Indians busy with their internal problems so that the British can rule the country without any distraction. They followed what was famously known as divide and rule policy. If you carefully look at the history, all communal riots began only after 1857, artificially engineered by the British authorities. There were no communal problems in India before 1857. Of course, there were differences between Hindu and Muslims, but there was no animosity. All communal riots and animosity began after 1857. The British government created a split in the Indian society in three stages. First, they favoured the Hindus, then was the turn of Muslims, and at last they turned their attention towards the backward classes. I can continue talking about the divide and rule policy in depth, but then we'll deviate and this will be a never-ending video. Anyhow, what you need to know is that after 1858, the British government carefully started dissecting the Indian society on communal grounds, and this continued till 1940s. Alright, so after 1858, Indians were slowly understanding the British intentions, because they were clearly exercising control over the resources of India and the lives of its people. As a result of that, the actual political uprising in India during British rule first began in 1870s and 1880s. Groups like Pune Sarvajanik Sabha, the Indian Association, the Madras Mahajan Sabha, the Bombay Presidency Association and of course the Indian National Congress started emerging. The late 19th and early 20th century witnessed the rise of nationalism not just in India but in many Afro-Asian countries. In India, the most important political group which went on to become the widespread political party of that time was the Indian National Congress. It was formed in 1885. The Indian National Congress during its initial phase, that is in its first 20 years, was dominated by politicians with moderate political views. These moderates used petition, prayers, meetings, leaflets and pamphlets, memorandum and delegation to present their demands in front of the British government. Moderates were not able to achieve notable goals other than the expansion of the Legislative Council by the Indian Council Act of 1892. This created dissatisfaction among the people. Without criticizing much, you need to understand that at that time, the Indian National Congress consisted only of educated elites. Not everyone saw Congress from same lenses. By the 1890s, many Indians began to raise questions about the political style of the Congress. Even some of the party members opposed party's moderate attitude, especially towards the fight for self-government. Then on 19 July 1905, Viceroy Curzon partitioned Bengal by separating the largely Muslim eastern areas from the largely Hindu western areas. The main motive of the British was to curtail the influence of Bengali politicians and to split the Bengali people, but in reality it turned out to be a communal split. The Bengal partition is another example of British government's divide and rule policy. In the very same year in December 1905, the partition of Bengal became the rise of extremism in the Indian National Congress. In other words, there was a split in the Indian National Congress. Now you have to carefully understand two things. First, the Hindus were unhappy with the partition of Bengal, but the Muslims were in favour of it. And the second thing is, there was a split in the Indian National Congress in terms of political views. 
If you see Congress, which always said that it represents all different communities in India, they failed to attract Muslim leaders to their sessions. So keeping all this in mind, many Muslim community leaders viewed the Congress negatively. And because of the partition of Bengal, the Muslim upper class and many influential Muslim community leaders met Governor General and Viceroy Lord Mintu in Shimla on 1st October 1906, which was called the Shimla Deputation. The aim of the deputation was to win the sympathies of the British Raj on their side concerning matters relating to their interests as a community. And then within a few months after the Shimla deputation, on 30th December 1906, the Muslim leaders formed their own national political organization, which came to be known as the Muslim League. Notice all forms of political uprising during the British rule were initiated and started by rich, upper middle class, elite, educated people, irrespective of their religion. But one thing for sure is that they complicated a lot of things, sometimes out of self-interest, and sometimes hiding among the amorphous crowd. Anyhow, since it was the first Muslim political party in the history of India, naturally, Muslims of all British Indian provinces found shelter and voice under the mainstream political umbrella of Muslim League. In other words, I want you to remember this point. The partition of Bengal in 1905 was the reason behind the political uprising of the Indian Muslims in securing representation in the government. After 1906, year after year, the Muslim League in their annual session started preparing schemes and reforms. One of it was to demand a separate electoral representation in the Imperial Legislative Council of British India. In 1908, the British fulfilled their demand by providing some reserved seats in the Imperial Legislative Council. And this demand kept increasing as they wanted more and more seats. And the British kept listening and giving more and more representation. So connect this point with what I said earlier that the British first favoured the Hindus and then pleased the Muslims, part of their divide and rule policy. Anyhow, as you can analyse, the Indian Muslims were now in favour of the British. But then in the year 1911, during the Delhi Darbar, the partition of Bengal was cancelled by the visiting Royal Majesty George V because of the mounting pressure caused by the Hindus. This made the Indian Muslims angry and made them realize the importance of standing on their feet and not depend too much on the British. That's when the Muslim community realized that they had to organize themselves politically. One more thing that I forgot to add is that during the end of 19th century, there was a push to establish a modern system of education for the Muslim population of British India. That was called as the Aligarh Movement, which gave birth to the first Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental school in 1875. And this very same school went on to become the famous Aligarh Muslim University in 1920. Now if you all remember the beginning, I told you that during the British rule, the whole of the Indian subcontinent was divided into two sets of territories. One was under direct British rule and the other was under the princely rule. So all these political movement that we just learnt were actually taking place in the British controlled provinces. These movements were not taking place in the princely states. Now I want you to understand that the British controlled provinces were facing political uprising of these different communal groups. But then, don't assume that the rulers of the princely states had no clue about it. They were very much aware of what was happening in other parts of the subcontinent. And as a ruler, they could not grant any political rights or allow the feeling of nationalism get into the minds of the people of their kingdom. That would cause rebellion. So they had to keep their kingdom unexposed to these nationalist movements. And if you see, it was in the ruler's best interest. Hence, there was no political uprising in the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir till the 1930s. Now we'll look at the political uprising in Jammu and Kashmir princely state. Maharaja Pratap Singh died in 1925. After him, his nephew Hari Singh became the ruler of Jammu and Kashmir. Maharaja Hari Singh was considered as an autocratic ruler. Remember when I said from medieval period, Kashmir went in the hands of one ruler to another. When Kashmir was under the Muslim rule, the Hindus were oppressed. Same way when it was under the Sikh and the Hindu rule, the Muslims had a hard time. Since the last ruler was a Hindu Dogra ruler, for obvious reasons he did not grant any fundamental political rights to his subjects. And during his rule, the Muslim community comprised of almost 85% of the entire population of the state. 
there was no question of having any civil, political and human rights because princely states were running on feudal system. As I said, there was no political uprising in the state of Jammu and Kashmir till the 1930s. But then it had to happen someday. On July 13, 1931, the Kashmiri Muslims started protesting against Maharaja Hari Singh because they were unhappy with the Maharaja's rule and his policies. This was the first time and the beginning of an organized and mass uprising against the rule. Now this resulted in an ugly battle between the people and the armed Royal Dogra soldiers. Many Kashmiri Muslims died and this incident gave birth to a new revolution called the Quit Kashmir Movement. Throughout history, we know that revolution has always given rise to political party or a group that stands up and tries to be the political representative of the suppressed mass. That's how Sheikh Abdullah along with Chaudhry Ghulam Abbas forms Jammu and Kashmir's first major political party called the All Jammu and Kashmir Muslim Conference which later in 1939 changed to National Conference to suit the secular nature of Kashmiri culture. In other words, Sheikh Abdullah's political debut started with the Quit Kashmir movement against Maharaja Hari Singh. By the way, Sheikh Abdullah studied in Aligarh Muslim University, where the idea of two-nation theory emerged. So he knew about the Muslim League and its objectives, and how to embark on a political journey. After 1931 Kashmir agitation, on April 1932, Maharaja Hari Singh appointed the Glancy Commission. The function of the Glancy Commission was to inquire into the various complaints and to examine the grievances of communal and general nature. The commission recommended the establishment of a legislative assembly. It was called the Praja Sabha. The commission also recommended giving 21 reserved seats in the legislative assembly for the Muslim community. The Maharaja accepted these recommendations but delayed its implementation which led to protests in 1934. In September 1934, the first elections of the Prajasava, that is the state's legislative assembly, were held. Sheikh Abdullah's party, All Jammu and Kashmir Muslim Conference, won 14 of the 21 seats reserved for Muslims. Then in 1937, Sheikh Abdullah met Jawaharlal Nehru for the first time. Since Nehru was a leader of the Indian National Congress, who was demanding similar rights for people of British India provinces, and I also said, at that time, princely states didn't have any sort of government. It was basically running on feudal system. There was a group called All India States People's Conference that was formed in December 1927. So the objective of this group was to start political movements in the princely states. That means till 1927, the people of princely states did not have any sort of exposure to any nationalist movement. It was only in 1930s this revolution started. This is an important point to remember when it comes to knowing the political uprising in India during British rule. Anyhow, in 1937, Sheikh Abdullah met Jawaharlal Nehru for the first time. Since Nehru was the leader of the Indian National Congress, who was demanding similar rights for people of British India provinces. And Nehru was also in support of the people of princely states in the struggle for a representative government. So naturally, these two became friends and political allies, and they started helping each other. Maharaja Hari Singh was fully aware of all these things. He was aware of the growing friendship between Sheikh Abdullah and Jawaharlal Nehru. In fact, Hari Singh never liked the Indian National Congress. He also did not like the Muslim League. Basically, he did not like this entire nationalist movement because he was a Raja. And as we know, the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir was very friendly towards the British Empire. In 1937 provincial elections, which were held in British India under the Government of India Act 1935, elections were held in 11 provinces and they are Madras, Central Provinces, Bihar, Orissa, United Provinces, Bombay Presidency, Assam, Northwest Frontier Province, Bengal, Punjab and Sindh. Out of these 11 provinces, the Indian National Congress won in eight. The three provinces where they could not form the government were Bengal, Punjab and Sindh. On the other hand, the All India Muslim League failed to form the government in any province. And that's when the Congress rule first began in British India from 1937 to 1939. Muslim League then started attacking the Congress regarding its insensitivity towards Muslim culture. 
in March 22, 1940, the All India Muslim League leaders assembled in the Sindh province, which was known as the Lahore Conference. There they passed a resolution for the establishment of a separate homeland for the Muslims of British India. So basically the creation of Pakistan was decided in 1940 that is 7 years before independence. Now going back to the political movement in Jammu and Kashmir as i said the national conference was the leading political party in Jammu and Kashmir under the leadership of Sheikh Abdullah. And i have also told you the reason why he changed the name of his party to National Conference because initially it was Jammu and Kashmir Muslim Conference. But then in 1939, he changed it to National Conference to suit the secular nature of Kashmiri culture. And we also know that the friendship between Sheikh Abdullah and Jawaharlal Nehru was growing. Now, what happened was in 1940, when the Pakistan resolution was passed, few leaders of the National Conference party, led by Chaudhry Ghulam Abbas, started disliking Abdullah's leaning towards Nehru and the Congress. and also they did not like his secularization of kashmiri politics so naturally in the year 1941 a group led by chaudhry gulam abbas broke off from the national conference party and restarted the old muslim conference in a matter of time this new party the muslim conference started aligning itself ideologically with the all india muslim league and supported its call for an independent pakistan and they started asking for support from the muslims of the jammu region and from the kashmir valley in april 1944 sheikh abdullah proposed a naya kashmir program to the maharaja calling for a constitutional monarchy a constitutional monarchy is a form of government in which a non elected monarch functions as the head of the state within the limits of a constitution Political power in a constitutional monarchy is shared between the monarch and an organized government. This move was criticized from the Muslim Conference, who said that Sheikh Abdullah was doing it to boost his own popularity. In the very same year, nineteen forty-four, Muhammad Ali Jinnah visited Kashmir during the summer in support of the Muslim Conference, because Jinnah wanted Kashmir to be part of Pakistan. But Sheikh Abdullah had something else in his mind. he was not very keen in joining pakistan it is very evident otherwise he could have joined the all india muslim league long back instead he leaned more towards the indian national congress because i think somewhere he knew that pakistan would be a theocratic state and on the other hand india had a secular credentials just to say few more words on sheikh abdullah i mean just think for a second let's say sheikh abdullah really wanted to free the kashmiri muslims from the dogra rule Let's say for a second he's right in whatever that he's doing, but then it would be ridiculous to think that his party had all the good people with good intentions. That is why some of the Muslim leaders broke away from his party and his ideology, and then he did not even consider joining the Indian Muslim League. So all of this tells me that he had some other intentions in his mind, and the same can be said about the Congress. I personally don't think Jawaharlal Nehru had all the good intentions in the world. The same goes for Jinnah. So I think they all had their own personal intentions. Anyhow, in May 1946, Sheikh Abdullah launched the Quit Kashmir movement against the Maharaja. He was then arrested and charged with sedition. When he got arrested, you can easily guess who came for his help. Jawaharlal Nehru came for his help, but he was denied entry into the state. In June 1946, the leaders of the Muslim Conference met Jinnah in Karachi. and were told to capitalize on the failure of Sheikh Abdullah to unseat the Maharaja you can imagine that there was a massive pressure on the Maharaja one from the national conference party for arresting Sheikh Abdullah the second pressure came from the muslim conference after meeting jinnah and the third pressure came from jawaharlal nehru in the same month british cabinet mission came to india to discuss the transfer of power The main objective of cabinet mission was to find out ways and means for the peaceful transfer of power in India and to create an interim strong central government. It rejected the Muslim League's demand of Pakistan. It was in full support of India's unity. The cabinet mission also advised the rulers of the princely states to enter into negotiations with the successor government. After hearing the plan of British cabinet mission in the month of July 1946, Maharaja Hari Singh used his own brains and declared that Kashmiris would decide their own destiny without any outside interference or any government. 
After hearing this, the Muslim conference started stirring some anti-Hindu sentiments in the guise of Muslim unity. Also the fact that the Muslim League rejected the cabinet mission's proposal. In August 1946, Jinnah along with rejecting the resolution, he called on all Muslims throughout India to observe a direct action day for demand of Pakistan. There was a massive communal bloodshed between Hindus and Muslims in Calcutta. For more on that, you must read about the direct action day. Anyhow, in January 1947, elections were held for the Jammu and Kashmir state's legislative assembly. This time, the Muslim conference won 16 of the 21 Muslim seats. Because Sheikh Abdullah was in prison and the objective of Muslim conference was to merge Kashmir with Pakistan. In March 1947, communal violence broke out in the state of Punjab this was actually the extension of 1946 direct action day if you remember on 19th august 1946 there was a massive communal riot between muslims and hindus in the city of calcutta it was declared by mohammad ali jinnah in demand for pakistan so this riot had spread till punjab and then some muslim league leaders in the northwest frontier province had sent agents to kashmir to prepare the people for a communal riot keep in mind sheikh abdullah during this time was still in prison in the middle of all these communal riots lord mountbatten arrived in india as the last viceroy of india on 3rd june 1947 mountbatten proposed the partition plan to divide british india into independent dominions of india and pakistan he visited kashmir for 5 days to persuade the maharaja to accede to india or pakistan the maharaja showed reluctance in the month of august 1947 the leaders of the muslim league and indian national congress formally communicated their acceptance of the plan for the partition of the subcontinent into pakistan and india from 11th august 1947 to 13th august 1947 partition violence erupted in sialkot and drove the surviving hindus and sikhs to jammu all the hindus and sikhs who lived in sialkot region fled to jammu on 14th august 1947 pakistan was created with mohammad ali jinnah as their governor general and on 15th august 1947 the british government transferred the power of india into the hands of indian national congress with jawaharlal nehru as the first prime minister as i told you in the beginning partition happened only of the british controlled provinces that meant after 15th august 1947 the princely states would be completely independent and they would not receive any form of help or support from the government of india for defense finance and other infrastructure now these independent princely states had two options either to join india or to join pakistan many say that there was also an option to remain independent but then you need to understand that most of these princely states were landlocked entities and were functioning with huge support from the british government Now that the British government were no longer there, some day they had to merge with India for administration support. And the British knew this, in fact they wanted to look good while advising these rulers to accede with India or Pakistan, because then they can say to the whole world that they helped India become unified. Anyhow, when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir, Maharaja Hari Singh had to decide whether to join India or Pakistan. As we have understood till now, he did not like the Indian National Congress. He also did not like the Muslim League hence he signed the standstill agreement with both India and Pakistan a standstill agreement is a contract that contains provisions on how two parties in this case India and Pakistan can offer their deals which would be in the best interest of Jammu and Kashmir and the Maharaja and one more important thing you need to understand is that a standstill agreement can effectively stall or stop the process of a hostile takeover if the parties cannot negotiate a friendly deal basically maharaja hari singh acted very smartly by signing the standstill agreement or simply we can also say he wanted to buy some time to decide what to do i'll leave it up to your understanding regarding his motives keep in mind after 15th august 1947 both india and pakistan became a full fledged country from the month of september 1947 jammu and kashmir was facing minor threats from pakistan because pakistan badly wanted kashmir to be part of pakistan jinnah could never develop a relationship with sheikh abdullah or with the maharaja so the only other option available to pakistan was to use force 
In September 1947, Pakistan first blocked the supplies of essential food, petrol and clothing to the state and thereafter sent tribal raiders to take control of the state. And it was during this time, Maharaja Hari Singh had somewhat made up his mind to accede with India. Nehru and other Congress leaders in Delhi were very well informed about this situation. In fact, Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi even demanded the release of Sheikh Abdullah as part of the negotiation with the Maharaja. As a result, he was released immediately. Nehru even said to Maharaja Hari Singh to make friends with the National Conference Party and allow Sheikh Abdullah to lead the government after the accession. This is a classic example how the table has reversed, wherein a ruler who once had immense power now has to listen to a politician and pretty much accept whatever he has to propose. On 22nd October 1947, that is two months after partition, Pakistan invaded the Jammu and Kashmir state from the west and northwestern side. Maharaja Hari Singh initially fought back but could not hold them back any longer. So in fear of losing his state to Pakistan, he appealed for assistance from the Indian government. He then reached out to Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and Deputy Prime Minister Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel, who agreed to send troops and help the Maharaja only on the condition if he would sign the instrument of accession in favour of India. Many of the western districts of Jammu and Kashmir were invaded and captured by the Pakistani troops. On 26th October 1947, the Maharaja signed the instrument of accession and acceded to the State of Indian Union, handing over its control of defence, external affairs and communication to the Government of India in return for military aid. It is very important to note these three subjects. Only the control of defence, external affairs and communications of the Jammu Kashmir state were given to the Government of India. Because these words are important and they play a crucial role in defining policies when it comes to centre and state relations. Nothing more, nothing less. Anyhow, at that time the Viceroy of India was Lord Mountbatten. He accepted the accession with a remark. He said, and I quote, It is my government's wish that as soon as law and order have been restored in Jammu and Kashmir and her soil cleared of the invader, the question of the state's accession should be settled by a reference to the people. In simple words, it was Lord Mountbatten who proposed the idea of plebiscite. Plebiscite is basically a referendum, where the people of particular region gets to vote and decide what is best for them. Now this remark from the Viceroy is said to have sowed the seed of the Kashmir dispute. He was the last Viceroy of India and also the first Governor General of Independent India. His tenure lasted till 30th June 1948. For a second just think about it. At the time when Maharaja Hari Singh was signing the instrument of accession, we know that he was being attacked by the Pakistani troops and the Pathan tribals from the western and the northwestern side. He was pleading to the government of India for help. That means he was not in a demanding position. I personally sometimes think if the government of India had wisely laid out their demands, which included joining India with no condition whatsoever, the Maharaja anyhow would have accepted because he was in fear of losing his kingdom to Pakistan. The Maharaja would have anyhow accepted whatever the demand the Indian government had laid out in front of him. Had it not been for Lord Mountbatten and his remark, the outcome would have been totally different today. Anyhow, Lord Mountbatten's remark and the offer made by the government of India to conduct a referendum or plebiscite to determine the future status of Kashmir led to dispute between India and Pakistan regarding the legality of the accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India. Because you need to understand this, Lord Mountbatten and the government of India were on one side supporting the idea of plebiscite. But Pakistan along with Muhammad Ali Jinnah as their governor general were not in favour of plebiscite. Because you need to recollect what happened to the state of Junagadh. Junagadh was a princely state with Hindu majority and a Muslim ruler. In 1947, the Muslim ruler of Junagadh acceded to Pakistan. Remember the instrument of accession? It says it is up to a ruler to decide whether to join India or Pakistan. That's how in 1947, Junagadh joined Pakistan. But in 1948, the Indian government proposed a plebiscite and the people of Junagar chose to join India. So this incident had some impact on Jinnah. 
plus the presence of Indian Army in the state of Jammu and Kashmir convinced Jinnah that a plebiscite under the supervision of the Indian Army would not be a fair one. So all these were the reasons why Pakistan rejected the idea of plebiscite. They simply believed that Kashmir, with its massive Muslim majority, belonged to Pakistan as an essential element in an incomplete partition process. Anyhow, on 27th October 1947, the Indian Army's 1st Sikh Battalion was airdropped in Srinagar, where they resisted the Pathan invasion and officially completed Kashmir's accession to India. On 31st October 1947, Sheikh Abdullah was appointed as the head of the Emergency Administration in Kashmir. On 1st November 1947, Lord Mountbatten and Muhammad Ali Jinnah met in Lahore. Mountbatten offered India's proposal that the accession of Janagar, Hyderabad and Kashmir should be decided by an impartial reference to the will of the people in the form of a plebiscite. Jinnah rejected the offer. He basically wanted these Muslim-majority regions to be part of Pakistan. On a side note, the western districts of Kashmir was erupting with violence. In November 1947, shortly after the state's accession to India, the Hindu leaders launched the Jammu Praja Parishad with the objective of achieving the full integration of Jammu and Kashmir with India. They believed Sheikh Abdullah was being a communist with anti-Dogra sentiments. On 28 December 1947, Mountbatten recommended India to take the matter of Kashmir to the United Nation, where he says it would have a cast iron case. He believed the United Nation would order Pakistan to withdraw its troops and allies from Kashmir region. The proposal was discussed in the Indian cabinet. All throughout the end of December and beginning of January 1948, India and Pakistan constantly argued and presented their case on the Kashmir issue in the United Nation. Just war and diplomacy was going on. On 20th January 1948, Sheikh Abdullah, as a member of the Indian delegation to the United Nations Security Council, raised the possibility of independence for Kashmir. He even said, these are his words, and I quote, How raiders came to a land, massacred thousands of people, mostly Hindus and Sikhs, but Muslims too, abducted thousands of girls, Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims alike, looted our property and almost reached the gates of our summer capital, Srinagar. So you can imagine that so much was happening in Kashmir after the partition. There was a total chaos and communal violence. Lord Mountbatten remained the Viceroy of India till the mid of 1948. And still there was no effort made by the British government in sending British troops to maintain law and order. I'm not saying to fight, but at least to maintain law and order, the British should have helped. There was no attempt of any kind. And then on the other hand, Sheikh Abdullah was exploring the possibility of independent Kashmir. Because Kashmir had Muslim majority, and if it fell in the hands of Pakistan, Sheikh Abdullah knew that it wouldn't be a good deal for him. Because his party already had a fallout in the 1930s, wherein some leaders of his own party joined the Muslim League in support of Pakistan, and they disliked Abdullah. And another thing is, if Kashmir fell fully in the hands of Pakistan, he would have had a hard time getting elected in the region of Jammu, because the people of Jammu and other eastern district of the state saw Sheikh Abdullah with anti-Hindu sentiments. And if you notice, till now his party national conference was winning the provincial elections on communal basis and that too on reserved Muslim seats. And I also believe that if Abdullah had publicly said that let's join India permanently, I'm sure a lot of Muslim population in the Kashmir Valley and also in Jammu wouldn't have connected with him and would consider him as an agent of the Indian National Congress or a sympathizer of the Hindu Dogra community. So I believe Sheikh Abdullah knew his politics well and he wanted to be at the center. And the central option was to accede with India and remain united with India, get all the help from the Indian government to stabilize the situation but he did not want the Indian government to interfere in the internal affairs. In other words, he wanted to have maximum possible autonomy. Basically, he wanted to govern the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir independently. Sheikh Abdullah took oath as the Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir on 17th March 1948 with the support of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, the Indian National Congress and also Maharaja Hari Singh. 
On 1st January 1949, a ceasefire between India and Pakistani forces left India in control of the eastern part of Kashmir Valley, which consisted most of the Jammu province and Ladakh, while Pakistan gained control of the western districts, comprising the present-day Azad Kashmir, the Gilgit Agency and the Baltistan, which is today collectively known as POK. Basically, the government of India was doing all the work to stabilize the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, one year has already passed since partition. India had to draft the constitution, which, as we know, came into effect on 26 January 1950. The task of forming the constitution was given to the Constituent Assembly, which was formed in 1946. Now, in the year 1949, Sheikh Abdullah and Maharaja Hari Singh came to some sort of agreement that Jammu and Kashmir should remain united with India with maximum possible autonomy. But please don't think they became very good friends. They just came to a common agreement. So on 16 June 1949, nominated by the Maharaja, Sheikh Abdullah and his colleagues joined the Constituent Assembly of India. In the same month, the Maharaja announced his son, Karan Singh, to be the governor of the state. Now, if you read the full text of the instrument of accession, which was signed by Maharaja Hari Singh, in that clause 7 says, Nothing in this instrument shall be deemed to commit me in any way to acceptance of any future constitution of India or to fetter my discretion to enter into arrangements with the government of India under any such future constitution. It was this clause that made Sheikh Abdullah demand Article 370 from the government of India because he was driven by his ambition to be the ruler of independent Jammu and Kashmir. Now the question is, was the Maharaja in favour of Article 370? I mean, when we read the full text of the instrument of accession, it does look that Maharaja knew what he was doing and he was pretty much aware of it. He clearly mentions that there is no way he wants to accept any future constitution of India. So the question is, was the Maharaja really in favour of Article 370? Or it was just the idea of Sheikh Abdullah and his party? So let me answer that. Well, the Maharaja had different outlook on it. But he was in favour of Article 370. Although he did not design it, but he was in favour of it. You know why? Because it would help him to keep his throne. He was thinking like the British Empire. Even today, the United Kingdom has a monarchy. And then there is the British Parliament. In similar way, Maharaja Hari Singh thought if Sheikh Abdullah can convince the government of India to give special status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir through Article 370, then he would get to act like a monarchy, which if you see is good deal for him. By now, you must have realized that it's so complicated, right? Everyone had an agenda, self-interest of some sort. So that's the way it was. While the Maharaja thought Article 370 would help him keep his throne. But I also want you to understand that Sheikh Abdullah had his own ambitions too. As I said, he knew his politics well. As we know, Sheikh Abdullah and Jawaharlal Nehru were close friends. And both were in favour of having a referendum or plebiscite which means it is the people of Kashmir who gets to decide whether they want to join India or Pakistan. Hence, he emotionally persuaded Nehru to give special status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir because of what they were going through. In fact, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, who was the first law minister of India and also the chairman of the drafting committee of the Indian constitution, he refused to draft Article 370 because he knew by giving such special legal provisions to the state of Jammu and Kashmir would create lots of problems rather than solving. And we all know what Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru did. He got a member of his cabinet, who was also a member of the drafting committee of the constitution, N. Gopala Swami Ayangar, and asked him to do the job and frame Article 370. Nehru agreed to Article 370 and he said, it was a temporary provision and will get eroded over a period of time. Now there's a question that comes in a lot of people's mind that why did Nehru listen to his demands? After all, he was the Prime Minister of India. He could have forced Kashmir with military power to fully join India. He could have very much done that. But the reasons presented to him by Sheikh Abdullah were very humane. It's important again to understand the context. If India could claim Kashmir purely by virtue of the Maharaja signing the instrument of accession and not care about any further conditions, then in the similar way, Pakistan's claim over Junagar and Hyderabad would have been justified. Because Hyderabad and Junagar were ruled by a Muslim monarch. But they were home to a Hindu majority population. 
they were mirror images of Kashmir. If India accepted the right of Kashmir's monarch to accede to India, then morally it had to concede these two states to Pakistan. Plus, the Kashmir issue had become international. It was in United Nations. So, in a way, Nehru believed in Sheikh Abdullah. He thought if he would let Abdullah have his government in power, then he will convince the people of Kashmir to fully join India without any referendum. So, on 17th October 1949, the Indian Constituent Assembly incorporated the Article 370 in the Constitution of India, ensuring a special status and internal autonomy for Jammu and Kashmir with Indian jurisdiction in Kashmir limited to three areas agreed in the instrument of accession, which were defense, foreign affairs and communications. On January 26, 1950, the Constitution of India came into effect. Elections were held for the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir in 1951. 75 seats were allocated to the Indian administered part of Kashmir and 25 seats were left reserved for the Pakistan administered Kashmir. Sheikh Abdullah's National Conference Party won all 75 seats of Indian administered Kashmir. It was said that the National Conference Party had rigged the election. There was no opposition party. No other party were even allowed to contest in the election. There were many groups like the Jammu Praja Parishad, Kashmir Political Conference. They were not even allowed to contest in the elections. Nehru was aware of all these things. He even said nothing should be done to weaken Sheikh Abdullah. Somewhere Nehru believed in Sheikh Abdullah and thought if I let him have his government in power, then he will convince the people of Kashmir to fully join India without any referendum. It was believed that Sheikh Abdullah ruled the state in an undemocratic and authoritarian manner during his period. He did not allow any political leader of any party to enter into the state of Jammu and Kashmir. On November 1951, the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir passed the legislation stripping the Maharaja of all powers and making the government answerable to the State Constituent Assembly, of which he was the head. Then in June 1952, State Constituent Assembly considered a proposal for abolishing the hereditary monarchy and wanted to replace it with an elected Sadar Riyasat, which is called Head of State. In the very same month, Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, Sheikh Abdullah, met Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, in Delhi, which is commonly understood as the Delhi Agreement of 1952. It is often called as an agreement between Jawaharlal Nehru and Sheikh Abdullah, which is heavily criticised. Now you could ask yourself a simple question. When Article 370 was already in place with immediate effect from 26th January 1950, then what was the need of the Delhi Agreement in August 1952? So in the meeting, Abdullah explained and demanded Article 35A, which extended Indian citizenship to the state subjects of Jammu and Kashmir. He wanted Article 356 and 357, which is the President's rule, be made non-applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. He also recommended the deletion of Articles 12 to 35 relating to fundamental rights. Then he also wanted the withdrawal of central services such as Indian Administrative Service and the Indian Police Service. And there were many more such illegitimate demands. You see, after the 1951 state elections, Sheikh Abdullah and his government were running the state in an undemocratic manner. As we also know that the National Conference Party only won the Muslim reserved seats of Kashmir Valley and kept only their interests and sentiments in mind, while completely ignoring the sentiments and aspirations of the people of Jammu and Ladakh, whose combined population was greater than that of the Kashmiri Muslims. That is why today you will notice that how come a small region of Kashmir Valley is able to rule the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir since independence. And if you look at the length and width of Kashmir Valley, which is occupied by India, it is just 135 km in length and 32 km in width. So how come such a small region is able to dominate the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir, including Ladakh? Isn't that surprising? So the Delhi Agreement of 1952 was basically a well-strategic move by Sheikh Abdullah to make his position secure from any future democratic assemblies and governments that may force him to enter into competitive power games, which he could never afford to win. Plus, Nehru had already made a blunder by adding Article 370 in the Indian Constitution back in 1950. So, Sheikh Abdullah was basically capitalizing on the blunders and mistakes that Nehru had already made. 
सो दैट वॉज दी होल डेली अग्रीमेंट ऑफ नाइनटीन फिफ्टी टू ऑल अबाउट एनी हाउ अब्दुल्ला एंड नेहरू एंटर्ड इन एन अग्रीमेंट एंड नेहरू वॉज इन फुल सपोर्ट ऑफ इट नेहरू फुलफिल्ड एंड एंडोस्ड ऑल ऑफ अब्दुल्लाज डिमांड ऑन नवम्बर नाइनटीन फिफ्टी टू दी कॉन्स्टिट्यूंट असेंबली ऑफ जम्मू एंड कश्मीर एडोप्टेड ए रेजोल्यूशन विच एबॉलिश द मोनार्की सिस्टम एंड रिप्लेस इट विथ एन एलेक्टेड सदर ए रियासत हेड ऑफ स्टेट सो प्रीवियसली इफ यू रिमेंबर महाराजा हरि सिंह मेड हिज सन करण सिंह एज द गवर्नर ऑफ द स्टेट बिकॉज दैट वर द रूल्स ऑफ द प्रिंसली स्टेट्स द नेक्स्ट इन लाइन गेट्स टू बिकम द हेड ऑफ द स्टेट दैट वॉज द हेरिडेटरी क्लेम सो दैट काइंड ऑफ एंटाइटलमेंट इज कॉल्ड मोनाकी एंड इट वॉज अबॉलिश्ड बाई द शेख अब्दुल्ला गवर्नमेंट इट गॉट रिप्लेस विद द टाइटल सदर ए रियासत हु इज लाइक अ गवर्नर एंड हैज़ टू बी इलेक्टेड बाई द लेजिस्लेटिव असेंबली ऑन ऑगस्ट नाइनटीन फिफ्टी थ्री शेख अब्दुल्ला वॉज डिसमिस्ड एज द प्राइम मिनिस्टर बाय द देन सदर ए रियासत डॉक्टर करण सिंह सन ऑफ महाराजा हरि सिंह ऑन द चार्ज दैट ही हैड लॉस द कॉन्फिडेंस ऑफ हिज कैबिनेट देर वॉज अनदर फॉलो ऑफ विद इन हिज पार्टी मेम्बर्स बख्शी गुलाम मोहम्मद वॉज अपॉइंटेड एज द न्यू प्राइम मिनिस्टर हु सर्व एज द डेप्यूटी प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ द स्टेट ऑफ जम्मू एंड कश्मीर बिटवीन नाइनटीन फोर्टी सेवन टू नाइनटीन फिफ्टी थ्री ही वॉज द लॉन्गेस्ट सर्विंग प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ जम्मू एंड कश्मीर द रीजन शेख अब्दुल्ला वॉज रिमूव एज द प्राइम मिनिस्टर बिकॉज ही अलॉन्ग विद ट्वेंटी टू अदर्स वर अक्यूज ऑफ एंटी नेशनल एक्टिविटीज एंड स्टरिंग सेंटिमेंट्स फॉर इंडिपेंडेंट कश्मीर एंड होल्डिंग प्लेबिसाइट थ्री ऑफ शेख अब्दुल्लाज फाइव मेम्बर कैबिनेट अपोज दिस आइडिया ऑफ शेख अब्दुल्ला इवन द डेप्यूटी प्राइम मिनिस्टर बख्शी गुलाम मोहम्मद वॉज नॉट इन फेवर ऑफ दिस आइडिया दे ऑल रिपोर्टेड दिस इंसिडेंट टू डॉक्टर करण सिंह हु वॉज द सदर ए रियासत Even Jawaharlal Nehru was in favor of Sheikh Abdullah's arrest after seeing the evidences because if you remember Nehru supported and strengthened Abdullah because he thought he is going to convince the people of Kashmir to join the Indian Union without any referendum or plebiscite on February 1954 the constituent assembly under the leadership of Bakshi Gulam Mohammad passed a resolution confirming the accession of Kashmir to India on 14th May 1954 With the help of a presidential order, Article Thirty Five A was incorporated into the Constitution of India. Now, this article came into existence because of the existing Article Three Seventy. If you look at the Article Three Seventy, Section One, Clause D, it allows the President to make certain exceptions and modifications to the Constitution for the benefit of state subjects of Jammu and Kashmir. In nineteen fifty four, the President of India was Rajendra Prasad. On the advice of Jawaharlal Nehru. and his cabinet as part of giving special status to the state of jammu and kashmir they all made or we can say forced dr rajendra prasad to sign the constitutional order bringing article 35a into the constitution of india if you can recollect this was part of the 1952 delhi agreement between nehru and sheikh abdullah now the whole fuss about article 35a is that if you want to add delete or amend any article in the constitution it has to be done through a parliamentary procedure which means first the bill has to be presented in both the houses of the parliament and then it has to be passed in each house by a majority of the total membership after that it has to be presented to the president who shall give his assent only then it can be added modified or amended in the constitution now when it comes to article 35a it totally bypasses the parliamentary route of law making it was never presented in any of the houses it was directly sent to president rajendra prasad and he was simply asked by nehru to sign it this is the whole problem with article 35a and as i said demand of article 35a was part of the 1952 delhi agreement between nehru and sheikh abdullah that is why jawaharlal nehru is heavily criticized for this move anyhow because of sheikh abdullah's immediate arrest after his removal His loyal party members started protesting in 1955 in demand of independent Kashmir and also demanded release of Sheikh Abdullah. One of Abdullah's senior leader Mirza Muhammad Afzal Beg launched a new campaign called the All Jammu and Kashmir Plebiscite Front which became a direct opposition to the state government which was now headed by Bakshi Gulam Muhammad. Sheikh Abdullah was released for a short while again he was rearrested and he was in prison for 11 years so this became the famous kashmir conspiracy case anyhow article 35a was officially added on 14th may 
through a presidential order and it was intended to be a temporary provision why because it was derived from the main article 370 if you look at the article 370 section 1 clause d that's where the presidential order was issued and then if you see the whole article 370 in general it is a temporary provision so naturally anything that is derived from article 370 will be temporary in nature now the question is if these two articles were temporary in nature then why it never got deleted or was it ever meant to be deleted to answer these two questions i want you to first have a look at the instrument of accession which was signed by maharaja hari singh in that clause 7 clearly says that nothing in this instrument shall be deemed to commit me in any way to acceptance of any future constitution of india or to fetter my discretion to enter into arrangements with the government of india under any such future constitution that means the state of jammu and kashmir could not be compelled to accept any future constitution of india further if we analyze the jammu and kashmir had full rights to draft its own constitution and to decide for itself what additional powers to extend to the central government so article 370 was designed to protect those rights and the article 35a is a by product of article 370 if i have to summarize article 35a it basically gives the jammu and kashmir legislature to decide who all are permanent residents of the state and based on that the state will then give special rights and privileges in public sector jobs acquisition of property in the state scholarships and other public schemes and welfare now if the state government gets to decide who can stay in the state and who cannot then naturally the government will allow those people who will favor their government it's a good recipe for having a permanent vote bank the state government can easily secure itself from any future democratic assemblies and governments that may force the existing state government to enter into competitive power games now you can imagine how strategically article 35a was demanded by sheikh abdullah during the delhi agreement of 1952 now through clause 7 in the instrument of accession and article 370 jammu and kashmir had the right to draft its own constitution but then the constitution of jammu and kashmir was adopted on 17th november 1956 try to understand this carefully we know that article 370 was added to the indian constitution in 1949 and article 35a was added in 1954 but then the constitution of jammu and kashmir came in 1956 and came into effect on 26 january 1957 Without the constitution the JNK the Jammu and Kashmir state had no law or a legislative assembly so from 1950 to 1956 the constituent assembly of Jammu and Kashmir requested the government of India that only those provisions of the Indian constitution that corresponded to the original instrument of accession should be applied to the state and that the state's constituent assembly when formed would decide on the other matters and the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir was formed in 1951 so it took them 5 years to draft their constitution till then article 370 was protecting them by giving special provisions that means none of the articles of the constitution of india were applied in jammu and kashmir apart from those three subjects defense foreign policy and communications that were mentioned in the instrument of accession because the government of india agreed to their demands and we clearly know the article 370 was a temporary provision that means article 370 was supposed to last till the formulation and adoption of the state's constitution and only the state constituent assembly had the right to abrogate or amend article 370 but then on 25th january 1957 jammu kashmir state constituent assembly got dissolved without recommending either abrogation or amendment of the article 370 Next day that is on 26th Jan 1957 Jammu Kashmir Constituent Assembly adopted its own constitution that's how article 370 was considered to have become a permanent feature of the Indian constitution and Nehru did not raise any concern hence it is very important to note that article 370 was a temporary provision that was given on a compassionate ground to mitigate a volatile situation but then it became permanent just to appease a certain segment of the population who belonged to the kashmir valley as i've told you before the length and width of the kashmir valley which is occupied by india is just 135 kilometers in length and 32 kilometers in width such a small region but they are able to dominate the political structure of the entire state of jammu and kashmir 
including Ladakh, with the help of Article 370 and 35A. After adopting the constitution on 26 January 1957, elections were held for the first legislative assembly. Now in 1957, Jammu and Kashmir got its constitution and a legislative assembly. That means the state was ready to make laws for itself. In the 1957 elections, National Conference won 69 of the 75 seats. Bakshi Gulam Mohammad continued as Prime Minister. In 1962, elections were held for the Second Legislative Assembly. The National Conference again won 68 of the 74 seats. Again, Bakshi Gulam Mohammad continued as the Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir for one year. In 1963, he was replaced by Khwaja Shamshuddin. In 1964, the government dropped all charges in the Kashmir conspiracy case. Sheikh Abdullah was released after 11 years. He was very much liked and adored by the people of Kashmir Valley. After his release, he patched up with Nehru. In fact, Sheikh Abdullah became a mediator between India and Pakistan on Kashmir issue. Then Nehru died in 1964. And on 3rd January 1965, the Jammu and Kashmir National Conference became a close ally of the Indian National Congress and almost became the Jammu and Kashmir branch of the Indian National Congress. On April 1965, Indo-Pakistan war took place. As we know throughout 1950s and 1960s, Sheikh Abdullah was acting back and forth based on his ambitions and ambiguities regarding the place of Jammu and Kashmir within the Indian Union. However, the India-Pakistan wars of 1965 and 1971 made him see quite clearly that joining Pakistan was not at all a good option personally for him. And the idea of independent Kashmir, which was always in his mind, had gained more momentum after the death of Nehru. Sheikh Abdullah was very much in favour of the plebiscite. But then the central government was not. After Nehru's death in 1964, Gulzari Lal Nanda became the interim prime minister. And again for the second time, he became an interim prime minister after the death of Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri in 1966. It was in 1966 when Indira Gandhi became the Prime Minister of India. She was very strict with the Kashmir dispute and was not at all in favour of Abdullah's plebiscite option. And keep in mind, India had won both 1965 and 1971 wars due to which Indira Gandhi's status as a leader increased. That is when Sheikh Abdullah dropped his demand for plebiscite and realised that he had little choice except to follow the terms of India. That's when he gave up his plebiscite idea for gaining Chief Minister's chair. He then started talks with the Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi, for normalising the situation in the Kashmir region and came to an accord called the 1974 Indira Sheikh Accord. Part of the deal made him the Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir in 1975. Many believe that the Kashmiri movement for self-determination for independence came to an end with the accord. There were clashes between the Awami Action Committee and the plebiscite front. And in Jammu, the Janasang supporters, which later became the BJP, were protesting from the beginning for the abrogation of Article 370 and a complete merger with India. And if you look at the stand of the central government, since 1950, there were four presidential orders that were applied to integrate the state of Jammu and Kashmir with the Union of India. But nothing was done to Article 370 and 35A, which were supposed to be temporary. So basically, if I have to summarize the role of the central government, instead of saying strictly that enough is enough, come and join India with no condition whatsoever, they were instead making laws that would help them control the state of Jammu and Kashmir in the areas which mattered to them most and also make laws that would curb those activities of the state which could aim at rejecting Indian sovereignty. So the only question that remains is, what were the exact reasons behind Jawaharlal Nehru agreeing to the demands of Sheikh Abdullah regarding Article 370 and 35A, apart from compassionate and humane grounds? The exact reason is something we'll never know. We can only speculate on history because human beings have three lives, public, private and secret. And this is also the reason why Nehru is heavily criticized for fulfilling the demands of Sheikh Abdullah. And also when Maharaja Hari Singh was asking for help from the government of India to fight against the Pakistani forces and Pashtun rebels back in 1947, in return the Maharaja signed the instrument of accession. And it is the clause of that document which gave rise to this complication. So again, we can speculate that the Indian government was in the position to demand. They should have dealt with it clear-cut or negotiated in a much better sense. And maybe we wouldn't have faced such complications. 
With that, I leave it up to your understanding. At any point you feel you need more perspective or clarity, I recommend you to research and read more on it. Anyhow, this brings us to the end of this video. I hope this video was informative. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.